So thank you, uh, Robbie, Robin, Lisa, for worship and song. Um, let's adore him. Let's, let's adore him in prayer right now. Father, we thank you that you are seated on your throne, regardless of what rages around us, what goes on around us, Father. Challenges, struggles, strife, you are on your throne, and we praise you for that, Father. And help us to remember that each day, each minute of each day. And Father, as we go to your word now, we just pray that uh, you would open our hearts and our minds to what you would have us to hear from your word. And Father, we would not just be hearers, but we would be doers also. In Christ's name, amen. So, um, my hope is, is that you've been following along daily with the Bible reading plan. And if you haven't, shame on you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lisa said there was, just sang a song and said, leave your shame at the door, we'll leave the shame at the door, we'll start over tomorrow, right? And uh, we'll start with Psalm 21, and if you'll notice, there's a pattern. Every Monday we read a new psalm. Just wait till the Monday till we read Psalm 119. <laughs> yeah, you'll be there for a minute, yeah. But uh, every Monday we read a psalm, every Wednesday we read a proverb, every Friday we read the passage that we will be focusing on on Sunday evening. And then Tuesday and Thursday is kind of a mix-up of important passages that relate to what we're going to be teaching on. So I hope that you have been following along. And if you remember last week, at the end of Romans chapter 8, we're going to be in Romans chapter 9 if you brought your copy of the Bible with you. If not, um, there are a couple out in the foyer, and we'll have the scripture on the um, screen also. But Hopefully you've been reading along, and maybe this week when you got to Friday and you read Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 13, you said, wait a second, Paul. Wait a minute. Weren't you the guy that just got through writing that we need to be celebrating all that Christ has done for us? celebrating all that the Father has done for us. We should be celebrating the fact that if we're in Christ, we have eternal life, and our, our eternal security has been decided. We should be celebrating that. That's exactly what Paul just got through writing. And then we flip the page to Romans chapter 9, 1 through 13. And yes, I'm going to be looking at my, at my uh, time, so I won't keep us too long, I promise. It, no more than an hour and a half, I promise. But um, as we flip to Romans chapter 9, we see Paul talking, changing directions in a drastically, drastically different way. And he brings some big questions out, a couple of huge questions that impact not only Paul, but I would say they impact each one of us every day. And we might ask the question a little bit different or present the problem that, that Paul presents in not Romans chapter 9 a little bit different. We might say something like, God, are you really good? You ever been there? You ever asked that question? I imagine all of us have. And that leads to, as we're reading through Scripture, sometimes we look, come to a passage of Scripture and we say, God, I don't see the goodness here. This is hard. This is a difficult, difficult truth. I don't get it, God. Are you really here? That's almost what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 9. And I want us to look at what Paul says and thinking through that and thinking and knowing that at some point many of us will go down that same path and will question the goodness of God in our lives because of circumstances and will question the authority of God's words at points because we don't really understand it, or we don't like it. And today, I have to say this, I want to preface this sermon, this teaching, with this big disclaimer. We're discussing the doctrine of election. 
And we cannot do that in 15 minutes. We cannot do that in 20 minutes. We cannot do that in an hour. We cannot do it in two hours. This is a huge topic that bears a lot of prayer and thought and thinking. But here's where I want us to land. And this is the title of the sermon today. And I, I like titles. You know, sometimes I find it hard to write things unless I have a title. But here's where I want us to land. I want us to see, and I said it like this, the infinite goodness of God in election. The infinite goodness of God in election. And I use those words very carefully. Infinite. Without end. In other words, something we as mortals, as mere people, can never understand. And at the same time, I don't want to trivialize any difficulties any of us have faced or facing now or will face. And I don't think that Paul does that. Let's look and see. Romans chapter 9. We're going to read the first five verses here. This is, this is Paul. And remember, he just got through in Romans chapter 8 telling us that we are eternally secure. Right? We should celebrate. We are eternally secure. And Paul says this. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Wow. Paul's taking a different path than last week, isn't he? In just a few sentences, he's gone from celebration to sorrow and get this, unceasing anguish in his heart. Why? For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. The ancestors are theirs, and from them by physical descent came the Christ who is God over all, praise forever. Amen. Wow. Paul is taking a drastically, drastically different path. And he's bringing out, I would say, two problems here. And the first problem is quite simply this, that we experience sorrow and grief. We experience sorrow and grief. Paul says that he has Unseeking, unceasing anguish in his heart. And the reason why is because his Jewish brothers and sisters are rejecting Christ. Remember, this is the same God that said the only way for salvation, the only way to be right with God was how? How was it? Through faith, exactly. Remember, he's pounded this point over and over and over multiple times. And he's saying these same people have rejected that faith. And it says it gives him unceasing anguish. And we think about how we, dis how we react to difficult situations like that. I've, I've been thinking this week a lot about Job. You remember Job? And on the day that he lost everything, he lost all of his possessions, he lost all of his animals, he lost even his children. The Bible says in Job chapter 1, it says, Then Job arose and tore his, his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground, and get this, and worshipped, and worshipped. He didn't just lose his house. He didn't just lose his job. He lost everything, including his children. I don't know about you. I doubt I could say this, what Job says. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. And get this, he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know if I lost one of my children, that I could say that. We experience sorrow and grief. 
I hesitate to use this example because it's still very fresh, but I think it's all, it, it fits in perfectly. There's a fairly well-known Christian blogger, writer, and author this week. He has a 20-year-old son that was attending Boyce College in Louisville, which is one of the seminaries for Southern Baptists. And this week, his son was playing a game with his sister and his fiance, and he collapsed. 20 years old, could not be resuscitated. Passed away at 20 years old. This was Friday, Thursday or Friday. His name was Tim Chalice. And this is what he wrote on his site Friday or Saturday, I don't remember. He said, yesterday Eileen, that's his wife, and I cried and cried until we could cry no more, until there were no tears left to cry. Then later in the evening, we looked each other in the eye and said, we can do this. We don't want to do this, but we can do this. This sorrow, this grief, this devastation, because we know we don't have to do it in our own strength. We can do it like Christians, like a son and daughter of the father who knows what it is to lose a son. I don't know about you, but the faith that he demonstrated in his words are over my head at this point. Hopefully, many of us, God will give us the grace when we experience difficulty like this to be able to face it in that matter. But the reality of it is, and Paul says this, is that we all experience sorrow and grief. And it makes us question the goodness of God. But that's not the only problem. Uh, hopefully you saw this next problem here, and I put it like this. We observe with imperfect eyes. We observe with imperfect eyes. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This is what Paul says about the Israelites. Verse 4, he says... They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple services, and the promises. The ancestors are theirs. And from them by physical descent came the Christ, who is God over all. Praise forever. Amen. What is Paul saying there? Paul is saying, God, this makes no sense. Everything would be on the side of the Jewish folks accepting Christ as the Messiah. Everything points to his brothers and sisters accepting Christ. But yet, they didn't. What do we do with this? Do we question God? I would say it's because we don't see things the way God does. In just a minute, I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 55. And in this passage, Isaiah says, For my ways are not your ways. This is God giving words to Isaiah. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are above your thoughts. See, our thoughts and our eyes and what we experience is not the wisdom of God. See, there's these two problems. We experience sorrow and grief, and we have a limited understanding of the world around us. And this is the, part, the two problems that Paul presents us in 1 through 5. And I want us to look at how he answers it. Let's look at how he answers it. Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Listen to what Paul says here. Now it is not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Amen. It is not as though the word of God has failed. Neither is it the case that all of Abraham's children are his descendants. On the contrary, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise are considered to be the offspring. For this is the statement of the promise. At this time I will come 
and Sarah will have a son. See, there's this great, pro this great reply that Paul gives us to these two problems, two massive problems of, of, of us experiencing sorrow and grief, and it leads to us questioning the goodness of God. It leads us to question the words of God, and Paul says it is not, a, it's not as though the word of God has failed. We wouldn't say it like this. We would say something like this. God keeps His promises. God keeps His promises. You might say, well, how do you know that? Well, Paul gives us the answer. God kept His promise to Abraham and Sarah. Maybe you remember the story of Abraham. I think it's worth thinking about it again. See, there was this man named Abram. Not Abraham, but Abram. Anybody know what the word name Abram means? Anybody? It means father of many. Imagine that. Your name is father of many. Your given name. And you're 75 years old and have no children. Imagine the ridicule. Imagine the scorn. And God appears to Abraham when he's 75 years old and he says, I want you to leave your home. Much like Valencia was talking about. I was thinking about this when she was speaking a minute ago. Leave everything to a place. I'm not even going to tell you where it is. I want you to go. And Abram says, let's go. And let's think about Sarah for a minute. Let's not leave her behind. In those times, one of the main ways to really define the worth of, a wo a worth of a woman in that culture was her ability to produce a male heir. And she had not produced any heir. 75 years old. And God promises Abraham that he will be the father of many. Imagine the years of ridicule and scorn. And by the time you're 60, 65, that ridicule and scorn transforms into pity. And at 75, God tells you that He has a promise to make with you. And it lifts your spirits and you obey God. Do you realize that it was another 25 years before Isaac came? 25 years. See, God keeps his promises. He kept his promise to Abraham and Sarah, regardless of the fact of physical limitations, regardless of the fact even of their own faithfulness, because we know that Abraham and Sarah were not faithful to God during this time. They tried their own plan to make their own heir. And God says, no. The seed of promise will be through your own son, will be through Isaac. If God keeps his promise to Abraham and Sarah, God will keep his promises to you and to me. You see, when we question the goodness of God, when we question things in Scripture that are difficult, Scripture shouts back, God keeps his promise. Paul says, it's not as though the word of God has failed. And so it begs the question, what are his promises? What are his promises to you and I? We see this a lot. I've, I've, I have to confess something this week that I have, I have gotten caught up. There was a, uh, a meme, a video that went around social media this week, and I must have watched it at least a hundred times of a prosperity gospel um, teacher, I won't call them a pastor, that was uh, calling down angels for material blessings. And it was set to some music and a, and a vibing cat, and it was hilarious. And I watched it at least a hundred times, I've got to confess. And we think about promises from God, and we think that that's what God has promised us, to give us stuff. couple of weeks, we're going to start an Advent series, a Sunday after Thanksgiving. I'm so looking forward to this, and I hope you will enjoy this as well. And we're going to call it the Messiah in Isaiah. And we're going to look at about 
all the messianic promises, all the promises of Christ to come in the book of Isaiah through this sermon series. And so this is just a little flavor of it. I want to show you some of the promises that God has made for us. If you want to follow along, it's in Isaiah 55, or you can just listen. Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me, hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Listen to this. Don't, don't, don't lose this. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know. And a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. That's us, folks. The nation that they did not know was us. God goes on to say this through Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. What an amazing promise we have. And we can't stop there. We've got to finish the chapter. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. These are the promises that we have from God. God's word has not failed. When we come to these places of doubt, when we come to these places of questioning God, the first reply, overwhelming reply we have is that God, keeps his promise. So what do we do with this? You know, here at Garden Church, we we like to use this um, um, comparison to agricultural things. So we want to sow this word. Sow the authority of this word. And let me say this. And I don't say this lightly. God is worthy of your trust. He is worthy of my trust. God is worthy of our trust. Now, we're talking about abstract things here, right? We're talking about mental things and faith. But when do we exercise it? You exercise your faith in these pews when you sit down on them. You exercise your faith in God's worthiness and trust when you exercise it. So where are you not exercising trust? Are you not exercising God with trust in your time? What's your prayer life like? Are you studying the Word daily? Are you exercising trust in God with your finances? Are you giving? Are you being generous with your giving? Are you exercising trust in God with your family, with your job, with your children, with everything. If 
we question the goodness of God, God shouts back at us. He doesn't just whisper. He shouts at us. He is worthy of our trust. He keeps his promise. But there's also a second reply that I, we have to see here. A second reply, Romans 9. And not only that, but Rebekah conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. For though her sons had not been born yet, or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to election, and there's that word, according to election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. Wow, that is tough. That is heavy. We cannot go through this whole doctrine of election in 15, 20, 30 minutes. I already said that, right? But what can we see? We see that God keeps his promise. That's the first reply. But here's another reply, and it's this. God's choice is not based on our own merits. God's choice is not based on our own merits. I could use the word works here. God's choice is not based on our works. It's not based on who we are, who we know, what we've done. And that's tough. But let me say this. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? God says he loves Jacob, but he hates Esau. How can God say that? I'm not making this up. These are God's words. This is where God has brought us. We've been walking through Romans. I didn't pick this out. What do we do with this? How do we grapple with this big subject? We think about the story. You know, he, he, Paul talks about Abraham and Sarah. Now he's talking about Isaac. Right? He's talking about Rebecca. Now let me say this. All you guys out there, none of us would have liked Jacob. Not a one of us. He was a big mama's boy. Right? <laughs> he was a liar. He was a cheat. He was a mama's boy. Nobody, none of us guys would have liked Jacob. We all would have loved Esau. Wouldn't we? He's the daddy's guy. He's the one that went out in the field and hunt, hunted with his dad. And he came back and he made uh, savory meals that, that Isaac loved, right? He was the hairy one, right? He wasn't the soft-skinned mama's boy. But God chose Jacob. Aren't you glad that God chooses not based on your merit. I don't know about you, but if it was based on my merit, it would be tough. Because I fail so much. You fail many times. We all fail over and over. And God says, it's not based on that. It's based on me. Paul says, and he says, but it's based not, on, not from works, but from the one who calls but from the one who does the calling. See, this is not about glorifying us. It's about glorifying God. You know, we think about this uh, topic, and we think about, um, you know, uh, the Garden Community Church is a Southern Baptist church, and, you know, we have this thing called the Baptist Faith and Message, and I think it's important that uh, if you're a Baptist, that you know what your denomination says that you teach. So I want to put this up here because as a child, you know, I grew up in a Baptist home and uh, in, a, in a Baptist home and we were at church every time that the doors were open and I never knew about what our denomination taught, especially about this subject, right? But I want to show you what it says. Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Listen to this. Election is the gracious purpose of God according to which he regenerates, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. Amen. 
Is that not what Paul just got through saying at the end of Romans chapter 8? It's exactly what he said. It is consistency. It is consistent with the free agency of man and comprehends all the means in connection with the end. It is the glorious display. Don't miss this. It is the glorious display of God's sovereign goodness. Those are big words. What is this saying? Election is the magnification of God's goodness. When we doubt God's goodness, when we doubt what God's word says, he says, not only do I keep my promise, I choose so that I get the glory. And it's infinitely wise, holy, and unchangeable. Listen to this. It excludes boasting and promotes humility. See, God's choice is not based on our merits. As a matter of fact, it encourages us to be humble before God because He has chosen us. But not only that, God's choice is not based on our merits. God's choice is for our good. God's choice is for our good. We think about this, Paul goes on to say in Galatians chapter 4, and let me encourage you, if you're ever in a place like this and you're struggling with doubt, you're struggling with things going on, Galatians is a great place to be in Scripture. It's a great place to be. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, four <laughs> Paul says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law. This is Christmas language, right? To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. See, God's choice is for our good. God's choice is to bring us from being a slave to sin, which Paul has talked about over and over and over again, to being adopted as sons and an heir of God, sons and daughters, being a son and a daughter of God and being an heir through God in Christ. God's choice is not based on our merits. God's choice is for our good. But here's the other thing. God's choice is for his glory. God's choice is for His glory. You know, we've been looking at uh, this language, messianic language, language about Christ to come. It's kind of a foreshadowing. I've done a lot of, of a leading up to, whetting your appetite for this series on Christmas. Here we go, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31. Read, listen to these words that God gave the prophet Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, get this, that they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant, here is our covenant, folks. This is what gives God glory. This is what makes it good for us. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more what a blessing what a promise see when we get to the point when we question God's goodness God says I keep my promises he shouts I keep my promises and the other reply is this this is all for your good and guess what? It's all for my glory. Now, what do we do with this? We're going to sow this. We need to grow in this. When I 
as Lisa was making this slide up, she said to me, you do know that you have the same sow and grow, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. And it's on purpose. And quite frankly, it's this. If we are to grow in this, we have to grow in the fact that God is worthy of our trust. I'm saying it twice. God is worthy of our trust. How do we grow in that? How do we grow in this truth? When we come to these places where we doubt God's goodness, we come to these places where we come to a difficult thing in Scripture, like election, and we say, God, I don't like this. I don't like the fact that it says that you love Jacob and you hated Esau. I don't like that. And that's not the only place that we'll come to in Scripture that we don't like some of the things that we see. Remember, brothers and sisters, God is worthy of your trust. Leave behind your doubt. As a child, like faith, trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. But I don't think we need to stop here today. We use this analogy, so grow, go. Thinking about how we're supposed to apply this, not just individually, but as a church. How do we as the Garden Community Church, you know, we need to sow this word in, we need to grow this, we need to show our trust, but how do we go? How does this change our life? And the first thing I want to challenge us to this week and then in the weeks ahead is we're building the Garden Community Church. I want us to remember this. Because God is worthy of our trust, we obey Christ's command to make disciples and to be discipled. You know, in doing church plants, it's like a roller coaster, right? You know, there are really great highs at times, and then there's great lows. And there's challenges and there's victories. It's an exciting time. It's not like going to an established church and everything's the same. There's ups and there's downs, and there's things to be done. You know, this week, uh, Lacey did a lot of work on these pews in here, and they look great. I love them. I look forward to, as we continue to uh, work on this building. I look forward as we continue to build partnerships with ministry. I look forward to reaching out to the community, all the things that we're going to be doing. But guess what? The one thing that God, that Christ himself has called us to is to be discipled, to make disciples. So here's the thing. If we're neglecting that one thing, then we're being disobedient. If we're neglecting being discipled and making disciples, we're being disobedient. As we go forward, I want us to think about that. How are we going to make disciples? How are we going to intentionally make disciples? Guys, we're going to be starting a discipleship group in the next week or two. Ladies, be praying for someone in your group to rise up and lead. Immediate application. Immediate. But not only that, not just internally, I want to say this. For our good, the Garden Community Church, we're going to pursue family restoration. We're going to pursue family restoration. Here's the thing. Today's Stand Sunday. That's why we have Valencia come and talk to us. When we think about our community and the difficulties across our community. We see in our own lives the impact strong families have made for each one of us. Why would we not share? Why would we not serve? We're a small group of people. What can we do? What, what is it that we can do? We're just a small congregation. We're just getting started. Folks, and I've seen it in every family, emphasis on fostering adoption, helping struggling families, family restoration. It comes through in every family here. And we have this promise. 
And Jesus said this, John chapter 14, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Huh. Because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now this is not the pastor, the teacher with the vibing cat calling down angels to give us material blessing. No, that's not what this was that I was watching a hundred times this week. This is Christ saying if you pursue anything for the kingdom, he will give us everything and everything we need to accomplish. Do you trust Christ? I do. Where are you putting your trust? Let's put his trust here. Let's be all in on this. Let's be all in on discipleship. Let's be all in on family restoration. But there's one more thing I want us to be all in on, and it's this. I want us to pursue multiplication. Pursue multiplication. What do I mean by that? No, not that we should be doing our multiplication tables. Three times two is six. Three times, no. Is without doubt the way today's world communities are reached for Christ is by church planting. New churches being planted. It's without a doubt the way things happen. And don't just listen to me. I, we can go over all the statistics. We're out of time to do that today. But this is the way things work in our world. And so if we want to be a part of that, if we want to get on board in this kingdom work, we have to commit ourselves to do it. And right now, right from the beginning, build that into our DNA. Folks, I'm not giving you an easy task. I'm not asking for something that we can accomplish in a couple of days. I'm asking for God-sized goals. I'm asking for things that God has to show up or it don't happen. Because God is worthy of our trust. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much that you are good. Even when we doubt you, we know that you are infinitely good, not just there for us, but you are above all. You are in control. You are on your throne. You are infinitely good. And you are at work keeping your promises for us. And Father, we ask now, as we close our worship time, Father, that you would show us how to apply this word to our lives each day. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing together.